Okay, does that look all right? Right, okay, thank you very much. Um, sorry, just moving Zoom things around. Oh, sorry, one second. God. There, we'll do it like that. Okay, um, so thank you, Manuel. Thanks, Nigel, for the introduction. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to talk here today. Um, so some of this is a sort of relatively complete story. And some of what I'm going to talk to you about today is very much a work in progress. So hopefully both will be of interest. Um, and I'd really enjoy talking about this more at the end of my presentation. Okay. So hopefully this audience is familiar with the fact that as the Earth rotates on its axis, there's a huge change in our visual environment. And this can dictate how organisms behave, how their physiology functions, and also how they interact with their surroundings. So I'm interested in vision and visual physiology. Um, and of course, what is really striking about this daily change is that it presents a really huge change in our visual environment. So central to that is the change in irradiance that occurs. Um, but on top of this, there are correlated changes in other types of visual information. So associated changes in the signal to noise ratio of visual information in the environment, changes in the illuminant, which can adjust chromaticity of light and reflected by objects, and also behavioral changes that can adjust the visual experience over the course of the day. And so a central question in visual neuroscience is how the visual system is able to remain functional throughout this daily cycle. I think this is made all the more impressive if you consider the fact that neurons in the visual system, just like all parts of the brain, have a relatively constricted uh, dynamic range, so maybe around 10 to the 3. But intensity of the light environment can cover almost 10 orders of magnitude. So you could use that threefold change in, in sort of coding to view a scene like this. But as soon as your the light intensity moves away from that of your visual sensitivity range, for example, moving into brighter or dimmer conditions, vision would fail. OK, of course, this doesn't happen. Um, and one reason for that is that the visual system encodes contrast. So the relative change in intensity. And on top of that, it's able to adapt. So there's some sensitivity normalization that occurs right throughout the visual system, starting with the photoreceptors that can adjust the sensitivity range of visual neurons to match that of the you know, prevailing light environment. So even though this process in theory could do the job, if you have really good adaptation, you can do this across the whole range of light intensity, most retinas and mammalian retinas use another tool and that's the evolution of two different types of photoreceptors, the rods and the cones. Um, so rods and cones are each specialized in different ways for vision in different light environments. So rod vision prioritizes sensitivity above all else. Um, so rod photoreceptors are highly sensitive, but they saturate at relatively modest intensities. And often this comes at uh, the uh, the loss of spatial resolution. Cones, on the other hand, are much less sensitive, but they're able to efficiently adapt and they can provide high acuity or color vision. So we have these two types of photoreceptors that provide quite different types of visual information. So this is in terms of their sensitivity range, but also in their temporal and spatial information. So of course, using rods or cones in the wrong light environment would also lead to quite poor vision. So what is it that determines whether rods or cones are used for vision? Well, of course, the primary factor is the intensity of light. So the range over which rods and cones are functional is obviously a reflection of their sensitivity range. And there are concurrent depend light dependent changes in the downstream circuits of rods and cones that are also adjusted according to light intensity. But on top of this, there's a strong correlation with when rods and cones are used for vision according to time of day. So we know that rods will dominate vision at night where the intensity of light is very low 
And of course, we can only really use cone photoreceptors. That is, we can't use, cone photoreceptors are predominantly used in the daytime because at night, light intensities don't reach their intensity range. So time of day information is represented in physiology by our circadian clock. And so my talk is really focused on understanding or exploring the idea that the circadian clock is used by the visual system to regulate the balance of rod and cone visual function and also wider aspects of visual physiology. Okay, so what is the circadian clock? Um, hopefully here, everyone here is familiar with the clock or has at least heard of it, but we know that the circadian clock is essentially an internal timing mechanism, which originates with genetic or gene networks that oscillate with a cycle of around 24 hours. So there's a self-regulatory feedback loop that's uh, present in most cells of our body that are central to these, this uh, circadian clock. The central circadian clock is found in the SCN. So this represents time of day in electrophysiological activity. And this can drive and coordinate genetic and physiological rhythms throughout our physiology. And some of those are highlighted here. So for example, there are rhythms that are synchronized to the environment like changes in melatonin uh, suppression, alertness levels, sleepiness, and so on. So as I said, these are all synchronized to the environment, the circadian clock is synchronized to the environment, but it also importantly will persist in the absence of those daily cues that entrain it. The clock is a way of predicting or anticipating changes in the environment in our physiology, okay? So importantly for this talk, we know that retinal neurons contain these clock genes, which show these daily cycles. And we know that many aspects of retinal physiology are in turn regulated by the clock. So this might be at the structural level. So we know that rod photoreceptor disc shedding, for example, is regulated by the clock. It might be genetic. There's hundreds of genes that are known to be rhythmically uh, expressed, driven by the circadian clock in the retina, and also neuromodulatory influences. So Neuromodulators like dopamine and melatonin show rhythmic behaviors over the course of the day. So all these factors can allow the retina to prepare for a future change in the visual environment. So is it also important in coordinating whether rods or cones contribute to vision? Okay. So how can we go about testing that? Um, and a simple but powerful approach is to use something called the ERG, which is the electroretinogram. So the electroretinogram allows an in vivo measure of field potential changes in the retina. So it has a very distinctive waveform um, and components of this can be attributed to the photoreceptors. So we have our hyperpolarizing A wave and then downstream neurons, the bipolar cells, which are replicate, uh, represented by this depolarizing B wave. And so this is quite a simple or a straightforward way of looking at in vivo retinal function. Um, in this case, in the mouse retina. And then what we want to do, obviously, is look at whether rod or cone vision is regulated by the clock. Okay, so we can do this by exploiting the fact that rods and cones operate at quite differences, different sensitivity ranges. So we can use stimuli focused at extremes of those sensitivities. So if we, if we look in very dim conditions, we can, below the threshold for cone vision, of course, we can isolate rod responses. Um, and this has been done uh, previously. So I'm just showing here data from uh, Morgan Cameron's paper a few years ago. But basically, consistently, people tend to find no evidence of rhythmicity in rod-driven responses. So looking in these dim conditions to isolate rod responses, if you do this at different points in the circadian cycle, there tends to be no rhythm in the amplitude or the timing of rod-driven responses. Okay, and what about cones? Well, we can do a similar thing and move to the opposite end of the visual sensitivity range um, and exploit the fact that rods will saturate at relatively modest intensities. So it's possible to record strong cone-driven light responses um, when we move from a dark adapted to a very bright background light level and then superimpose a flash on top of this. And so this is the kind of ERG that you can record um, that's originating with cone photoreceptors. And you can see there's an amplitude difference here 
uh, when we record at different phases of the circadian day. So CT6 is subjective midday and CT18 is our subjective midnight. So there's quite a clear circadian rhythmicity in the amplitude of cone responses uh, when recorded in this fashion. So it's important to note as well that if we do this in mice that are uh, lose critical components of the molecular clock, so for example, knockouts of the gene BMAL or CRI, all these rhythms are lost. So it definitely is uh, widely understood that this measure of retinal rhythmicity um, shows quite a clear and uh, reproducible effect. Okay. So this seems like a relatively complete story. Uh, we have cones that are rhythmic and rods that are not. But in fact, there's actually a large region of vision where both rods and cones are active. Um, and it's in these mesopic conditions that can occur any time across the day and night cycle that uh, might be interesting to explore further. And this is because, because those mesopic conditions can occur throughout the day and night cycle, the way the retina might need to function will be quite different. Mesopic light in the, will be the kind of maximal light intensity experienced at night, but it's maybe something that's encountered more sporadically in the daytime. And if you think about it, what that might mean is that light intensity itself might be a more ambiguous predictor of the prevailing visual environment. And so perhaps the optimal way for the visual system to work could be more uh, beneficial to use information from the circadian clock. So how can we look, about, look at visual responses in this range? We can't use um, light intensity, of course, because this is where rod and cone photoreceptors overlap. Ideally, we don't want to use different knockout models. Of course, there are mouse models that lack both rods rods and or cones. But of course, these rhythms and so on could be an emergent property of an intact system. And so what we want to do is use a, uh, an approach that allows us to look at rod or cone driven responses in the same animal. Um, so we need to consider ways in which rods and cones are different. Temporal tuning could work to isolate cones, but of course, there's a big overlap in the lower sensitivity range with rods. So what does that leave us with? Well, one way in which we know that different photoreceptors uh, show differences is in their spectral sensitivity to different wavelengths of light. So here I'm showing you three of the mouse outer retinal photoreceptors. Um, I should point out this is uh, using a mouse with a slight shift in the spectral sensitivity of its long wavelength sensitive cone. But you can see there's quite a distinct relationship with wavelength uh, compared to the sensitivity for each of these photoreceptors. If we know the spectral sensitivity of each photoreceptor, we can design spectra that will have a big difference, for example, in how much they activate one type of photoreceptor, but ideally remain equal or isoluminant for the others. So for example, in this case, we might want to generate a stimulus that manipulates the activity of rod photoreceptors. So we could do this by changing the output of an LED in this sort of green part of the spectrum. But of course, if we want to keep the cone photoreceptors equally active so that they're not detecting a contrast, what we can do is balance out the output of a light source at other parts of the spectrum so that ideally the relative excitation of our cone photoreceptors is going to remain constant when we move between these two spectra, but our rod photoreceptors will detect a large difference in contrast. So we've used this approach quite extensively and validated it in many conditions, so I won't go into all of those details now, but I'm happy to talk more about that at the end. OK, so that's the kind of theory. But importantly, we can do this in practice. So as I said, we use a transgenic mouse where there's a spectral shift in the sensitivity of the long wavelength sensitive go cones. And this is basically just to allow us to have the best utility of this approach. And we can design a visual stimulus using, for example, a six primary LED system that will only be visible, for example, to rod or in the cone photoreceptors. So this is what such a stimulus looks like. Um, so this stimulus is designed so that it will present a 70% contrast for rods, but remain uh, silent for cones. And you can see if we present a stimulus, uh, a transition between this stimulus at increasing background irradiances, we see a strong rod response at lower light levels 
But as we ramp up that background, you can see that they begin to saturate to do what we'd expect for rods. Okay. And we can do a similar thing for our cone photoreceptors. So in this case, we have a stimulus that's designed to have a 0% contrast for rods, but present a 70% contrast for both S and L cone photoreceptors. And again, in this case, you can see there's a gradual increase in amplitude and then it stabilizes as we're well within that cone range. And so you can see that quantified here. So as the increases, as the radiance increases, we can see in sort of physiological terms, that transition from rod to cone vision. Okay, so we have a stimulus that allows us to separate the response of rods and cones across the range of intensities that they are both active. So a simple hypothesis then, relating to our original question, is that maybe in this range, we'll essentially see what we did when exploring vision at the extremes. So we'll see a rhythm in the cone response peaking in the day, and rods will show no rhythmicity. Okay. So to do this, we have quite a simple experimental paradigm. Uh, we want to record visual responses using the ERG from mice at distinct phases of their circadian day. But of course, an, ex an important experimental point is that we want to ensure the retina is in a similar state of adaptation. So just to point out that all ERGs were recorded after about at least 18 hours of dark adaptation, and in this case, the clock will carry on ticking, but the light environment remains stable. Okay. And then what we did was at each of these different circadian time points was present stimuli across the irradiance range where we can record both rod and cone responses. So we have a period of, a period of adaptation to each background, and then we present rod or cone isolating stimuli at a range of contrasts in an interleaved pattern. Okay. So first of all, we looked at cone photoreceptors. So this is just showing a representative ERG that we record from one animal at two circadian time points. Um, and you can see, I hope, that the amplitude of this response is relatively similar at these two time points. And in fact, what we found when we did this across a number of animals um, and a different a range of stimulus conditions was that this is true across a range of intensities. Okay. And indeed, if we look at the amplitude of that response at different phases of the circadian day, basically we see no evidence of rhythmicity in this cone response when recorded in these mesopic conditions. So this is also true if we change the contrast of the stimulus. And indeed, if we vary the temporal properties of that response, uh, sorry, the stimulus, there's no evidence of rhythmicity in the amplitude or timing of these cone-driven responses. Okay. So if we return to our hypothesis, um, perhaps surprisingly, we don't see any evidence of rhythmicity in the cone response in this mesopic range. But of course, a lot of prior work has shown rhythms in cone activity. <clears throat> so why is this so different? Okay. And I think the most likely explanation originates with differences in methodology. And in turn, that kind of relates to what aspect of vision we're actually examining. Excuse me. So prior work typically uses a protocol that's really uh, best designed to highlight cone responses by silencing rod responses. And so to do that, you dark adapt the retina for a long time and then present a very bright light. And when you do that, you can start recording cone responses superimposed on top of that bright background and they increase over time. And it's in this kind of adaptational phase that we start to see that change in amplitude. Okay. But what I did in these experiments was look at cone responses following a period of adaptation. So actually there's a big difference in adaptational state between these two approaches. And so what that potentially suggests is that this rhythm that's being recorded in this uh, uh, adaptational paradigm is a rhythm that's either overcome by light adaptation so there's a rhythm there, but we can't detect it after adaptation has occurred. Or it could even be a rhythm in the efficiency of adaptation itself. So that the rhythm, obviously you can see here that build up over time, but the two converge, okay. And it's possible, so it's possible therefore that these rhythms in cone vision are overcome by light adaptation. 
I think another kind of relevant point is that we know that these rhythms are lost in animals that lack the photoreceptor melanopsin. And not to go into the details of this, we know that melanopsin is an important mediator of some adaptational effects in the retina. So this is potentially a mechanism by which this occurs, but of course, this does need some further exploration. Okay. So we've looked at cones, what about rods? We do a similar thing and present stimuli that excite rod photoreceptors across this mesopic range. Um, and now I'm just showing you a representative trace from, again, that same mouse recorded at two time points. And here you can see there's, hopefully you can see there's quite a noticeable change in amplitude according to the time of day that we recorded the responses. And indeed, if you look at that at increasing background light levels, so the response decreases as we reach that rod saturation, you can see there's quite a pronounced change in the amplitude, such that it's consistently larger at nighttime compared to daytime. So we can quantify this across a range of background light levels, and this is really clear to see. And we can also look at this at a, a range of different circadian time points. So as we move from uh, day to nighttime time points, you can see that there's a larger amplitude in the rod response consistently in the night. Again, if we look at this across a range of contrasts, for example, <clears throat> we see this change in amplitude. And indeed, this is a consistent effect across different temporal frequencies. So it doesn't seem like there's a shift in the tuning, for example, of rod photoreceptors in these conditions. There's an overall change in the gain of the response. Okay, so again, this tells us that our hypothesis was wrong. And actually there's a different thing happening in these optic conditions. Um, so rather than be uh, arrhythmic in very dim conditions, rods begin to show rhythmic responses as we increase that background light intensity. So what's happening here? Um, and in order to kind of explore what's happening a bit further, you need to know a little bit about retinal circuits because I think it's likely that we're uh, identifying a property of a downstream circuit from the rod photoreceptors. Okay. So <clears throat> rods and rod circuits are interesting um, because unlike cones, they never directly uh, they have a dedicated bipolar cell, but that bipolar cell never directly synapses with retinal ganglion cells. To do that, they always need to piggyback onto cone circuits in one way or another. So there are a number of ways that we know that this happens in the mammalian retina. Um, and I'll just quickly take you through those here. So we have the primary rod pathway which is known to be the highest sensitivity rod pathway. So it's responsible for those very dim flash responses. And that uses an interneuron called an amacrine cell um, in order to connect the rod bipolars to the, the cone bipolar cells. Okay. There's also a secondary rod pathway, which we know has a slightly lower sensitivity. So it becomes active at slightly brighter background light levels. And this instead uses a gap junction that connects the rod and the cone photoreceptors. So it's in this way that rod visual responses are conveyed through the retina to ganglion cells into the brain. And lastly, there's a tertiary rod pathway. Um, and in this case, we know that rod photoreceptors make a direct synapse with off cone bipolar cells. So this is a more specialized circuit that only responds to a decrease in light intensity. Okay. So, an important, we can explore each of these uh, pathways by modulating our stimulus in different ways. So the most straightforward seem to be to see whether this response to a flash was a response to an on or an off step. Okay. And we can do that quite easily just by presenting our stimulus rather than a flash, but a gradual step of light that has an up and a down component. And that allows us to separate on and off aspects of the response. And if we do that, we can see there's quite a pronounced rhythm in the on response, so the step to the positive contrast, but less so to that off response. So what this tells us is it's definitely not a rhythm that originates in this tertiary rod pathway, okay? The other important fact is, as I mentioned, that these two primary and secondary rod pathways both have quite different sensitivity ranges. So the fact that we don't detect rhythms in the very dimmest uh, stimuli that we use definitely gives us, uh, suggest 
that perhaps the rhythm that we're um, recording doesn't originate in this primary rod pathway. So of course, what does that leave us with? It leaves us with this secondary rod pathway. And indeed, there's actually prior evidence that rod and cone coupling that's central to this pathway is under circadian control. So this gives us quite a nice hypothesis then that the rhythms that we're looking at in the mesopic rod response are originating in this pathway and that they'd be sensitive to modulation of that pathway. Okay. So fortunately we can test this uh, experimentally and we can do this using um, an intravitreal injection of a compound MFA, which blocks gap junctions. And so, um, We've got quite a clear prediction then that if the rhythmicity is originating at this part of the, uh, the, the rod circuit, that the rhythms we would see should be sensitive to blocking this part of that circuit. Okay. So what's nice about this is that we can look at ERG amplitudes before and after injection of this drug. Okay. So um, in both cases, what you can see um, is a, uh, sorry, I'll just check what I'm showing you. Okay, yeah, so here's the before and here's the after the drug. So you can see um, before the drug was injected, we had this clear circadian rhythm in the response, so a much greater amplitude at night time compared to day. But once we've injected that drug, you can see that we lose that rhythmicity. And so we can quantify that by looking at the amplitude of responses at the two time points and before and after the drug. And you can see essentially that what happens is once we've injected the drug, those uh, amplitudes kind of all become close to that daytime uh, pre-drug amplitude. And we can look at that in a slightly different way, looking at the before and after the difference in amplitude. Um, and you can see that we see no clear effect at, in the daytime at CT6, but a strong effect at nighttime. And importantly, we don't have any effect of an injection of vehicle. So it seems quite likely then that this rhythm in mesopic conditions is occurring via this change in rod cone coupling. And it's important to note as well, I've not got the data here, but we didn't see any time of day impact when we did the similar approach, but looking at rod responses in a dim light condition. Okay. So hopefully what I've, uh, just to kind of put up what I've sum summarized, what I've told you so far, um, unlike uh, data looking at the extremes of visual sensitivities, when we look at this region where rod and cone vision overlaps, we don't see any rhythm in the uh, cone visual response, but rod response amplitude shows quite a clear nighttime peak. So separating rod and cone visual responses in this way tells us what's happening with each photoreceptor system. But what it doesn't tell us is what the overall impact is on vision across this mesopic range as would normally occur when both photoreceptors are active. Okay. So we can look at that quite simply just by extending our stimulus set to include a stimulus that also activates rods and cones to the same extent. And indeed that's what we did. Okay. So for this now, we're using a stimulus that's driving a response from rods and cones. And I'm just showing you the daytime response here uh, to begin with. And as you'd expect, when we're using a stimulus that can drive responses from rods and cones, we don't detect um, a clear saturation point or thresholding effect. And instead we see quite a clear uh, stable response amplitude over time, uh, over background light intensities. And that's just quantified here. And indeed, if we look at stimuli across a range of contrasts at each background, you can see that the response amplitude again is quite stable. So adaptation is doing its job. We see a stable response across this intensity range. If we do this at night though, what we see is that this kind of falls apart a bit. So while it's really stable in mid midday, at midnight, hopefully you can see there's a large response in these dimmer background light levels. And indeed this is um, replicated in the contrast sensitivity responses. So you can see that those amplitudes to uh, contrast pre presented at dimmer background lights are larger. So while there's a stable contrast sensitivity function at, in the daytime, when we do this at night, we see this bias towards larger amplitude responses. Okay. So what's happening here? And I think it, it might be useful to think about what happens uh, in our visual environment over the course of the day. Okay. So in the day, yes, irradiance is 
can be brighter and generally are brighter. But this is a change in the maximum intensity, not necessarily a constant intensity. And so depending on our behavior or moving cloud cover, irradiance can theoretically move across the whole visual sensitivity range in the daytime. So there's an obvious kind of utility in maintaining a fixed contrast, a fixed response to a given contrast to ensure kind of stability in the response as we move from dim to bright environments. On the other hand, at nighttime, irradiance never really exceeds the rod sensitivity range. So there's no clear benefit in aligning contrast sensitivity with the cone photoreceptors. So boosting rod signals to maximize intensity maybe makes sense. Okay. So everything I've told you so far has used the ERG, which is a really fantastic tool for looking at these, you know, gross global changes in activity and amplitude. What it doesn't tell us though, is what happens to those responses when they reach retinal ganglion cells or indeed the brain. So how are these retinal rhythms relayed throughout the visual pathways in the brain? Visual information obviously arrives at numerous brain regions and targets that are concerned with different aspects of visual and non-visual physiology. I'm interested in visual physiology and the primary visual pathway. And so for me, it was interesting to initially look in the dorsal lateral geniculate nucleus, which is the primary relay of visual information. And I had a couple of questions when looking in this part of the brain. Is the visual pathway regulated by the clock? Do we see this in terms of the rod cone balance, but also in terms of other aspects of the visual code? So what we did was record visually evoked activity in anesthetized mice using multi-channel recording electrodes. Um, and we can target specific brain regions. Um, and in this case, we looked at activity in the dorsal LGN, as I said, where we can record light evoked activity from single neurons. So again, we can do this at distinct times of day. Um, but what I did here was focus just on the subjective midday and midnight time points following our ERG data that showed that this was a clear point of difference. And again, prior light exposure was controlled to account for any long-term changes in adaptational state. So this was um, a fun task to set up some electrophysiology in the dark, but it was uh, just about achievable. Okay. So the kind of activity that we record from any single neuron um, from a population that we record from looks a bit like this. So we have a number of stimulus repeats. We have our uh, spiking activity shown in with each uh, black dot. And you can see when the stimulus is presented, we generate, we can record a lot of action potential firing in the brain. And so what we can do is then bin and average that uh, response. And we get a profile that looks a bit like this. And what I'm looking at here is just the on part of that response. So this is the response to our rod only stimulus, um, the mean from a number of neurons we recorded. And you can see, as we saw previously, we see responses to uh, the dimmer condition, but as we increase that light intensity, uh, those rod responses saturate. And we do the same thing with cones, and we can see a relatively stable response amplitude at the two intensities we recorded. And of course, we can then quantify that um, looking at the firing rate here. So what happens then at different times of day? Okay, so importantly, what we see is that, again, this rhythm that we saw in the retina is replicated in the brain. So we see a rhythm in the amplitude of rod responses now in the dorsal LGN, um, but a stable response um, in the cone-driven responses. Okay, so what we find again is evidence that there's a change in um, the amplitude of rod-driven responses in the nighttime compared to the day. And of course, when we think about rod vision and rod and cone vision, uh, one change that we might expect is that uh, rod vision has a, a, tends to have a lower spatial resolution. So given that we see an enhanced rod input at night, you might hypothesize that there'd be a change in spatial resolution of visual responses recorded in the nighttime versus the daytime. Okay. So with these in vivo recordings, we can actually look at that for individual neurons in a, in a couple of different ways. Um, so the first thing I did was map out spatial and temporal receptive fields. So this was just using a spike triggered average approach. Um, which in a nutshell describes the 
spatial and temporal pattern of light that a particular neuron will respond optimally to. So this approach is great because we can do this in parallel when we're recording from a population of neurons and identify the, the receptive field, if you like, for each neuron. So we have a stimulus like this, which is played at five hertz for about five minutes. And then what we can do is ask what change in that stimulus typically activated a neuron. So for this case, we see that this neuron uh, responded um, about 150 milliseconds after a positive contrast was present in this particular location. So these space time plots can be turned into sort of a spatial and temporal receptive field as shown here on the right. And we can use this approach to map receptive fields of different sizes and different polarities. So I'm just showing some examples here. Um, so what we find is that there's a significant shift in the distribution of receptive field sizes recorded in the subjective day versus the subjective night. So here I'm just showing the receptive field sizes recorded from the population of neurons we have in the day and nighttime recording. And so we find that there's quite a significant shift in that me uh, median receptive field size. And so potentially that suggests there's some aspect of this uh, visual response in these conditions that's affecting receptive field structure. And we can look at that, um, you know, spatial information isn't entirely defined by receptive field sizes or location. And so I was keen to look at another measure, measure of acuity. Um, and for this, I presented an inverting sinusoidal grating stimuli uh, that looks a bit like this, where every 250 milliseconds, we can flip between two versions of a grating stimulus like this. And as we increase the frequency of that stimulus, we can find the point at which neurons are no longer able to detect those gratings. So we can do this again at two time points. And what I'm showing you here is the mean response uh, from all the neurons we recorded in the subjective day. Um, and so uh, the finer bars are presented as you move down the plot. Um, and I should point out, we did this at a range of phases and orientations, and I'm showing you here the preferred phase and orientation of each neuron. So a simple way to quantify these responses is to do a fast Fourier transform and look at the power um, of the, uh, the particular inversion frequency that we use, which in this case was two hertz. And you can see in the daytime, we cover the range of uh, spatial frequencies shown here, gen generally record responses across that range. So what happens at night? Well, again, we saw that there was a shift in the resolution of responses recorded in the subjective night compared to the day. So in the day, um, there's a significant response that's still present at this highest spatial frequency, but at night, neurons no longer responded on average to that stimulus. And indeed, this becomes more pronounced if you look at the power of twice our inversion frequency, um, or at the inversion frequency, which captures both the on and off polarity responses that we record. So again, we have this big difference at this highest spatial frequency. So again, this just shows that there's um, a further evidence of a time of day adjustment in spatial frequency tuning of this primary visual pathway. Okay. So just to summarize this work, um, we find that the DLGN activity recapitulates basically what we see in the retina in terms of rod cone balance. But we also see a concurrent shift in the spatial resolution um, of visual responses recorded in this range. So here we see quite a pronounced impact of time of day on spatial resolution in the DLGN. And you know, my original hypothesis was that this might originate or be due to the shift from rod to cone vision or an increase in the rod contribution to vision. But of course, it's equally possible that this originates with parallel adjustments in visual circuits. Um, and I think it's important really to highlight that the retinal output isn't a single simple signal, it's diverse, and it encodes many different visual features. And what I think is even is particularly relevant is that we know that these different visual circuits that are apparent in the retinas of mice and all different species can become specialized to match natural variations in input. So neural circuits that process different parts of the visual field 
we know now have evolved to form quite different types of computations. So this image here is just taken from a recent review from uh, Tom Barden and colleagues, and they highlight a number of different types of uh, components of the visual uh, code, if you like, that show variations according to space in the retina, the spatial location. So I think a pertinent question is whether the clock might also represent an opportunity for a temporal or time of day specialization in the way that circuits can function. Okay, um, so I'll just, I'm aware of time, so I'll just take you through this bit of data. Um, and we've started to begin to address this question. Um, and so one way in which visual neurons can be categorized is in response to a temporally structured stimulus, such as this chirp stimulus that was used here. So um, this data from Tom Barden showed how functional um, responses in the retina can be categorized into a number of different channels that broadly relate to different um, anatomical cell types. And of course, we can do a similar kind of categorization in the visual thalamus using um, that kind of represent a subset of these responses. So the question I wanted to ask is whether this kind of coding scheme is something that is constant across time, or rather whether we see some adjustments in this code over the course of the circadian day. So for example, do we see a change in how certain visual channels are represented? So we can look at that and ask how neurons respond to different stimuli. I'm just showing you a bunch of representative neurons here, and you can see that we see quite a broad diversity in the responses that we record in the visual thalamus. And we can obviously do this in the subjective day and nighttime, and then we can simply ask, how do these two compare? And there's a number of ways that we can do this, but what I did was take a similar approach to this Barden paper and functionally cluster these responses. So what we did was combine data from the day and nighttime data sets we reduced the dimensionality of that response with a sparse principal component analysis. And then we used um, a, a clustering approach, a Gaussian mixed model to cluster the data to find similar response types. So rather than do this on each data set, we combine the data from the day and the nighttime. And this was to test the null hypothesis that there's no difference in the way that neurons in the day and the night respond to a stimulus such as this. And if that's the case, we'd expect a similar proportion of neurons from each time point to be found in each cluster. When we do this, we generate eight different clusters across the data sets. And you can see there's some variability here in the temporal aspects of the response and the contrast sensitivity range, for example. But then what we can do is assign clusters from each, uh, neurons from each cluster to our day or our nighttime data set. So what we're looking at here is the proportion of neurons recorded in the day or the night. And while they're broadly consistent, there are certainly differences in the response types that are more or well less re represented. So for example, the sustained uh, response type dominates in the day, but the dominant response type we see at night is more transient. Uh, this subgroup down here is very well represented at night, but much less so in the day. This is really early stages in this work, but I hope it highlights the fact that the circadian clock may have a pronounced impact on how visual signals are encoded, certainly at a population level um, throughout the visual system. So just to bring this together with some more general conclusions, um, I think we're all happy with the fact that optimization of the visual system can occur on quite different timescales. At one extreme, we have adaptation, that is a reaction to a change in the sensory environment so that can drive adjustments in function. What I hope I've shown you here is that how the circadian clock is another mechanism that can be used, but instead it rather predicts or anticipates changes in the sensory environment. And of course, because those things that occur over the time frame of hours, arguably the magnitude of those changes could be more extreme. So that features of retinal circuits that we consider to be relatively hardwired could ultimately change to optimize function over these kind of timescales of hours. Um, and of course, at the other extreme, we have evolution. So the time of day at which an animal is active can also have a big impact on whether its visual system is primarily used in certain light environments. And so the changes that we've seen that are driven by the circadian clock 
potentially are those that become hardwired into anatomical features of the retina. Okay. I was going to take you through this, but I'm just going to skip over that now um, because I just wanted to get to the, the final discussion point, which is what these data actually mean in the context of visual physiology and function. And of course, here I've taught in terms of day night changes that were apparent prior to the advent of artificial light. But of course, artificial light has essentially destroyed this relationship. These data would predict for a mouse, for example, that this artificial light at nighttime might present a short-term challenge for vision. So adaptation may be less efficient when we move between visual environments at different light intensities, or it might become more disconnected. And there could also be longer term costs for visual physiology, but we'd have, we're yet to have a good understanding about this. But there's certainly evidence that disruptions to the clock can have some you know, uh, pathological consequences for the visual system. So of course this needs further exploration. Okay. Um, and lastly, I just want to say thank you. So that's the end of everything I wanted to say, but I just want to say thanks to colleagues at the University of Manchester, um, especially the, the Time Vision Behaviour Group. Um, without many of these, I wouldn't have been able to put most of this talk together. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Anna. That was a really interesting talk. Um, it was great to see all of that data you have. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. Um, if the participants want to ask any questions, Anna, please write them in the chat. Uh, yeah, so I, um, maybe I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, the evidence that artificial light can have on this sort of rhythmicity of the rods and cones, I, or even if there is data from other species um, other than rodents. So in terms of um, how artificial light might uh, be implicated or, or impact this kind of relationship. I think there's sort of two clear, kind of two main effects. So the first, of course, is that as we as I've discussed, the light environment isn't necessarily what the retina has evolved to anticipate. So what that means is that that might present a challenge, or it might present um, well a challenge to how visual information is coded. We don't have too much evidence at the moment about, in, certainly in humans, the extent to which that may or may not be the case. But of course, the other aspect that we do know a bit more about is that artificial light at night or you know, certainly disruptions, which is one example of a disruption to the circadian clock, is that that can have quite pronounced impacts on how uh, our clock behaves, um, whether that's in terms of the outputs or you know dampening of rhythms and so on or uh, and so on so I think there's a lot to be understood um, yeah hopefully <laughs> Um, yeah, so Sylvia asked, uh, uh, hi, nice talk. Uh, I was wondering how changes in pupil size and does light intensity get into the retina impacts these findings? For example, in how far does pupil size account for changes in external light intensities? Okay. Um, an important experimental point that maybe I should have highlighted is that um, all of these recordings were made with a, a dilated pupil. So we dilate the pupil with uh, tropicamide eye drops. And this is just to allow uh, or to ensure that light intensity in that sense is controlled. I think it's a really interesting question though, the extent to which pupil size itself might also, you know, this is a further, this is an example of some aspect of adaptation in the visual system um, and how pupil size may be implicated in further changes is, is something that we, don't know too much about. There is a rhythm in the size of the pupil itself. There's definitely evidence for that. So again, it could be part of a, a kind of wider impact or influence of the clock. Yeah, uh, great. So Manuel asked uh, if you would expect these findings to translate to humans. Um, it's possible, yes. Sorry, was thinking. So I'm actually, um, some work that I've not discussed today is that we are looking at 
certainly looking at these effects in diurnal rodents. And I think it's an interesting question because I'm, I'm thinking as a, as, as a biologist, just that humans are a diurnal species and that this has some quite interesting implications because on the one hand, it means that the structure and function of the retina is slightly different. But on the other hand, the relationship with time of day is kind of similar, you know, it's still light in the day and it's still dark at night time. Um, so the extent to which we replicate these findings in humans, I think it's going to be quite interesting. It's definitely something I'd like to look at. Um, but yeah. Um, so Claude Gromfier asked, uh, well, superb presentation and that, thank you. Um, given that your hypothesis come from studies in a nocturnal species, I was wondering if you'd expect the same in a diurnal human species, for example, uh, no consistent rhythms in the sonic light. So I don't know if you know. <laughs> no, well, I'm glad, I'm glad it's obviously a, a kind of a common theme of the questions mm -hmm. because it is something that I'm, I'm working wow. on right now. Um, so, I mean, as a small spoiler, uh, looking at these effects in a diurnal species, we see similar uh, aspects in some, uh, some components of the rhythmicity. So definitely the sort of cone adaptational changes that have been described previously definitely seem to be consistent, um, but maybe slightly different effects in that mesopic range. Um, so I think it's, I think it's gonna be an interesting uh, outcome. Oh. Which diurnal species are we working with? Um, so, <laughs> so there are species that we've got in the lab in Manchester called uh, Rhabdomus pomilio, which are a four-striped grass mouse. So we got these uh, from a lab over in Harvard, but they're not, um, they haven't been a sort of a lab species for a long time, but we have them in Manchester for kind of interesting circadian uh, entrainment questions. But of course, I've, I've sort of nabbed a few to work on questions relating more to visual physiology as well. Uh, cool. So Fateme asks if you think that the response, um, that each cone would respond differently. So I guess each type of cone, if you would expect different results. Um, yeah, no, that's an interesting question. I've, I've got some data looking at whether we see more or less pronounced effects if we have code uh, stimuli that uh, activate one or, you know, the short or the long wavelength sensitive cone. Um, it seems that the effects are consistent between, um, uh, in terms of overall amplitude. So it seems like the, the absence of rhythmicity is consistent between the two types of cones. Um, but I think, um, yeah, so it seems to be consistent. Um, and then Quickin asked, can you talk a bit about how the subtypes of our PRGCs contribute to their responses? Um, so I didn't explicitly examine IPRGCs in this work or their contribution to these effects. Um, but that's not to say that they are not an interesting potential component of the, this, these kind of pathways. So a lot of what some, some of my previous work has, has uh, looked at whether IPRGCs and their measure of irradiance has an important effect on modulating the amplitude of visual signals, you know, upstream of, their, um, of them in the retina. And so I think it could be that IPRGCs are, are one of the potential, uh, you know, uh, components of this pathway. They might be uh, modulatory, it's hard to know. I think it is interesting that a lot of these, uh, the rhythms that were first described are shown to be absent in melanops and knockout animals. Um, obviously we don't know the extent to which that might occur, you know, within the retina itself or, or via changes in the input to the clock and then back again. Um, but I think there's a lot of interesting questions there. <laughs> Yeah, I think we can take this final question. So Maria says, for interesting presentation, were the mice working on a reverse cycle? And if so, how would you think the visual responses would differ compared to mice on a normal cycle or if it would differ at all? Um, well, they were on a reverse cycle. So some of them were on a reverse cycle and some of them were, when we say reverse cycle, um, they were housed with their light dark cycle at different phases of our, our kind of, time of day, if you like. So some of them, their light was 
uh, presented from eight in the morning till eight at night. And then in another bunch of mice, the light was presented at eight at night till eight in the morning. The purpose of that was that it meant I could record ERGs from those animals at two in the afternoon, and it would represent a different time of their circadian cycle. Beyond its actual impact on the circadian cycle, I don't think there should be any the consequences of the fact that they're on these reverse cycles if you like it should it it's kind of controlled yeah so i think that's it uh thank you very much again annette that was a fantastic talk and um yeah i think we can end the meeting now thank you very much <laughs> thank you